with teachers and pianists and friends. Today we're talking about how to teach the Mendelssohn Song Without Words, Opus 19, number six. This is one of the Venetian boat songs. It sounds like this. If we haven't met before, my name is Jana Williamson and welcome to my home piano studio in the suburbs of Chicago. This was a request from one of my viewers to cover this piece, so thank you so much for that request. If you have other pieces in the intermediate piano repertoire that you'd love me to discuss in a future video, please leave a comment below. I would love to know what might be most helpful for you. I love the Mendelssohn songs without words. I think they are total treasures in the piano repertoire. I don't think I'm alone in thinking that, but I'm not sure that they always get as much credit as they should. Of course, this one is very popular in the teaching repertoire, and there are, there are other handful of other ones that are in that mid to upper intermediate range that do get played by students. So I know this is one students enjoy playing. It's so melancholy and like that typical, you know, romantic kind of minor feel. Of course, it is called um, in the English translation, Venetian Boat Song, which is the subtitle. It's part of the Songs Without Words, the first group of them, that Opus 19. And it does have this feel of a barcarolle, a boat song in 6-8 time. There are many, many examples of barcarolle, such as Chopin's famous uh, barcarolle, but anything in 6-8 with that, mm -da -da, mm -da -da, mm -da -da, you know, where we can easily see ourselves in Venice sailing down the canal within a gondola. So that's kind of the general mood that we're going for here. I think this piece is difficult um, in many ways. I think it's mostly technically difficult. So there are some definite technical things to work on with your student just from the very, very start. We're in G minor, which is not too terribly difficult. There are a number of accidentals in here. Uh, and sometimes with the longer 6-8 measures, it's easy to forget one of them. Just one little caution, I've had almost every student who played this miss the second C-sharp in measure 14. So this scale that starts to pick up to 14, the C-sharp happens again on the bottom, that kind of alto-ish note. So make sure you don't miss that, make sure your students don't miss other accidentals throughout. So let's talk about the left hand first. When you start the piece, it's so easy because the right hand gets to play the you know beats two, three, five, six, um, while the left hand just plays the bass line. And if we had three hands, we could just continue doing that. We could have a bass line, a middle accompaniment, and then the melody on the top. Wouldn't that be nice? That's actually how most songs, most true songs, such as the Schubert leader, Schumann leader, that's how those are constructed. You know, have accompaniment in two hands, and then the singer, soprano, alto, bass, is singing the lead, the song, as that melody line. I oftentimes tell my students that um, in Mendelssohn's time, leader or songs, such as the ones by Schubert and Schumann, were incredibly popular. And the, the song became its own form in its own right. And that poetry was elevated, uh, people became obsessed with how to set poetry, you know, and they would use that form of a singer with a piano accompaniment to make that song. And I always feel like Mendelssohn kind of thought, we don't need the singer, we can do that all in two hands at the piano. But that's what makes them so challenging. We have a melody and an intricate accompaniment most of the time. So once we get to measure seven, the left hand has to do all of the accompaniment by itself. So what I would actually do first is play it in two hands. And you can either do this blocked or broken. I'm starting in measure seven and I'm gonna block it. So just the low G in the left hand and then that G minor second inversion in my right hand. So that's measure seven, measure eight, measure nine, are all the same chords, right? Once we get to 14, they change up a little bit. When you play it like that, it just sounds kind of like a standard chord progression that you would hear somewhere else. 
stuff. I think that's so valuable for students to actually get the sound in their ear of what's happening harmonically so that they know immediately if they play it wrong uh, when they're actually navigating everything in the left hand. Of course, you can also play it as written, but in two hands. In other words, not blocked. To get the true sound of exactly how it will sound. And then from there, you have to just practice a lot with your left hand navigating these leaps. It's a little bit like a Chopin waltz, you know, that has the big um pa pas, but it's just a little bit tweaked from that to have that 6 8 bark roll feel. So. He does thankfully use the same chords over and over again. So I really think that first one, the G minor, you could just practice that so many times that then you can do it with your eyes closed. You know, so you don't have to look. Same thing with the next one, the D7 over G. You know, really just practice that space. And so that therefore your brain and your ear later on are freed up to focus entirely on the right hand because we want to be focusing on the right hand. It has the melody. So let's move on to that. The melody is written in double thirds and sixths most of the time. This is what I'm talking about when I say this is technically demanding besides those left hand leaps. Um, I would suggest consulting a number of additions as as far as fingering goes for these because people have different opinions and you can certainly experiment with your own. Right now I'm looking at this in Maurice Henson's edition of uh, the Alfred Masterworks collection. This is the complete Songs Without Words, all 48 of them. There is a similar one, same edition, but just of only some of them, selected Songs Without Words. I will link both of those in the description. Um, I also have out my Masterwork Classics book eight here. Main differences in these two editions between McGraw and Henson, um, I actually kind of like McGraw's fingering better, so it's helpful for that for sure. She does not include pedal markings, whereas Henson does. So those are the two big differences that just pop off the page to me in looking at them. And like I said, I think as far as fingering goes, try some things yourself. For instance, um, after those first three thirds, which fingers do you want to put on F sharp and A? What feels most comfortable to your hand? Regardless, whatever you're doing, make sure that your arm, your forearm is aligned behind your fingers. It can be really tempting to kind of get like all tangled up with these and then you end up doing, you know, things that are not very comfortable. So thirds, followed by six. And the truth is, it's really hard to actually play these 100% legato with your fingers only. And you are gonna use the pedal. Your student is going to use the pedal. Um, so I love in these situations to encourage my students to do some practicing without the pedal so that they are aware of how much they're able to do legato just with their fingers and they're not deceiving themselves and really just playing detached and using the pedal to cover it all up. This also really helps you think about how you want to shape the phrase. So the phrase should kind of come down but go towards the more um, dissonant or interesting notes. Going to substitute and then hold that D for a little bit. That's really tricky. So that's what I'm talking about in this. You need to spend some time as teach as a teacher, you need to spend some time working this out for yourself so that you can help your student navigate it. Um, always with that weight transfer behind the fingers, you know, that you're not just putting finger motion here like this, but it's just the natural weight of the arm going behind the fingers to make a beautiful cantabile tone with your right hand. Cantabile means singing in a singing style. Remember, this is a song without words. So our right hands are supposed to sound like a singer, or in this case, two singers, because it's written as a duet. Uh, the same practice technique that I recommended for the left hand also works here. You can split the thirds and sixths into two hands and just play one note in each hand give you a really clear picture of what you actually want it to sound like when you're not worried about the technical difficulties of thirds and six. So I really strongly recommend that. It just gives a good sound picture in your ear. 
Beyond that, then the last challenge when you put your hands together, besides pedaling, which I mentioned, I do like the markings in Henson's edition here. Uh, beyond that, the big thing is then balance. And any collaborative pianist knows that they always have to work with their singer on not playing overpoweringly for the singer. We do want that top melody to sing out. And I do think that's one of the things that the Songs Without Words are so good for our students, is just working on balance of melody and accompaniment. So if we go back to that left hand part, while you're doing all that moving around, you have to do so without an excessive amount of motion so that it can just be very gentle. And this is something you'll just have to work with your students on. When you get down to the um, lower parts of this, I am looking at measure 18. It's less of a duet here and more of a top melody and the right hand is participating in the accompaniment. So very, very light thumb. I can't reach that with my two, so I have to do thumb, thumb. Really, really light with your thumb there. So work with your student on recalibrating the natural weight of their hand. Our hands normally go this way because our thumb has so much muscle in it. So they normally lean this way for more weight here. We have to recalibrate that so that the weight is coming more through our pinky and that the thumb is just very light. This is something that takes practice and years of repetition on working on that melody in the top. I hope that gives you a few ideas on teaching the Venetian Boat Song out of the Opus 19 from Mendelssohn's Songs Without Words. I wish you all the best in your teaching. If you have other pieces you'd like me to cover, like I said, please leave that in a comment below. Subscribe to my channel, share my videos with a friend if you found them helpful. Thanks so much.